Okay, welcome everyone. Project Hindsight Labs. This is a great series of seminars put on in order to, to share and um, establish a dialogue, a platform for where we can get really interesting discussions about history going, uh, particularly outside very what would be quite conventional formats of uh, history departments in universities and museums. We're, we're thinking where, where else does history meet other different types of organizations of specialisms and what can we productively get out of this. My name is Michael Weatherburn, some of you already know me, and it's a great pleasure to introduce you to our visiting speaker today, Mark Cox-Smith. Hey, Mark. Hi, Michael. Great to be here. Great. So um, a short biography. Um, Mark was uh, studied physics at Imperial um, and then has gone into the private sector ever since, so some years now. Um, and I'm sure he'll tell us about his specific work. You may have seen from his biographies, worked with Fortune 5 companies on aspects of cloud computing um, and other, what you might call AI. We'll probably unpack what does that mean in this uh, discussion, I'm not sure. Um, and he's also Project Hindsight's AI technology lead. He's been uh, connected to this organization for some time. And he and I have worked on several projects together and we still continue to do so. Um, and I can assure you, those, of, if you're of a historical bent and want to know more about the technological angle, this is for you. And if you're of a technological bent and want to know about the history angle, this is also for you. Perfect example of crossing over a very deep engagement with both specialisms to make both uh, even more productive. So Mark, why don't we just get started on a general point? Um, how would you describe your involvement with history or with your particular history initiative? So I would, I would say that it really comes from the fact that uh, from my role as a machine learning solutions architect, so that basically means that I help companies, as you mentioned, Michael, uh, all the way from startup to Fortune 500 companies, implement their ML architectures so that they can get, get the best out of their AI products. Um, now, as a part of that, it's really critical to understand um, the various versions of data and the various different parts of data that historically a company may have had. Um, so that's one aspect. Another aspect is increasingly you, you see quite a few companies who are really trying to make use of older data sets which were previously inaccessible. So say for example, archive data, um, data from the home office, data which is just stored in enormous databases somewhere or just enormous files which previously was totally inaccessible because someone would have to go and read and understand all of this and summarize it so um really that's where my involvement comes in and of course you know i've been very happy to work with you on the projects that we've been doing together and yeah really have uh, loved those projects so um yeah that's my been my involvement Thank you, Mark. I think you make a really important point within the historical discourse on this kind of um, challenge. We talk about paper archives and digital archives and digital archives have no shape often in the discussion, often because the person writing the, the paper has not so much technological experience to describe the kind of layering and the different types of files. Yeah. And crucially, I mean, as someone on this call, I won't, I won't embarrass them by naming it. They said, I can still go and read the Doomsday Book of 1086 but I can barely read files from 10 years ago, right? A thousand years old document is easier to read than a 10 year old computer file. It's really striking, but we can, as you say, make, make this productive and useful as well. It's not just a problem to solve. And even if it is a problem to solve, we can really try to solve it. Um, Mark, what would you say, um, give, what's your greatest success story so far in this kind of work? So I'd say my greatest success story um, is really the teams that have built out and the projects that have worked on as a result. So I've worked on a couple of award-winning, worked at a couple of award-winning startups and built a couple of, well, customer success um, solutions architect teams. And that's been really exciting. And seeing the kind of technological leaps that have been made has been really exciting. Um, when it comes down to the historical side, um, I would say that it's really been... Um, a couple of the projects that I've worked on where we've extracted some really fascinating insights about, I, I can't go into necessarily all of the specifics, but about some of what is hidden within these large troves of data, which previously just wouldn't have been understandable. And that for me was very exciting. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of development has been, been great. Thanks. I mean, even differentiating between data and metadata is not something I see in the, the regular literature. It is in the technological aspect, of course, but 
yeah, so it's great to bring the two together. Um, you mentioned managing teams. Mark, this is something you and I talked about before, but we got a, an online question about this. Um, both for people's individual skill sets, you know, managing teams, designing a massive organization. Um, there's a lot, been a lot of coding this and you know, do it your Python R or which one. But from my perspective, the more of these tools I use, the more of the coding is within the, the software package, right? I just drag and drop, tweak things here and there. So to what extent do you think coding is an essential skill that everyone needs to know? Or is it a specialist skill, kind of maintenance back end one? That not everyone will need to know. Like thinking, thinking forward, what what should we be engaging with in terms of skill sets? It's a really interesting question, and really, it's very topical as well because uh, Nvidia's Jensen Huang was also discussing this exact topic and discussing that coding may be a skill of the past. Um, I would say that um, it's something that certain people will continue to need, but increasingly few will need that particular skill set because um, as you mentioned michael a lot more tools have come out which are no code low code which enable people to achieve the same results at a significantly lower barrier which is really exciting because it enables people who haven't got the coding skills or haven't got sufficient coding skills to be able to achieve the same results so i would say that it's still going to be important from my uh, experience. So I have done a fair bit of coding in my time. It is still useful, it is still needed, but increasingly few people will need to do it. Um, and they will be increasingly specialized. Thanks, Mark. Um, that is, it's very thought provoking this because the, the, I mean, I, I saw even Wired Magazine wrote a response to the, the pronunciation you, you, you just cited. And, they said, well, oh, well, hold on, skills will be, coding will be necessary, but it will be a back-end maintenance job. And as you say, it becomes then a specialism rather than a general, like, do I know how to use a calendar or tell the time or something, which everyone needs to know, right? So it is, yeah. I think, a lot of, very thought-provoking for a lot of people on, on this call and, and watching the video later as to what they might spend their time learning, as it were. Just as the same Absolutely. discussion we have, is it, you know, with various packages can translate foreign languages very easily now, is it a skill I need to, to enhance? And I, I sure spend a lot of time learning um, spoken languages, as it were, um, uh, for many reasons. Definitely. But you know, in certain respects, it, is this something I need to, to really spend my time on? Um, now, Mark, something I'd love to talk about. Um, I guess we could split this into sort of two ways. The kind of, the two areas which I think that people probably instinctively are thinking we're gonna talk, and we, we hopefully will, about tasks. Like I've got a specific challenge. What software can I use to solve the challenge? Which is great, please do so. Yeah. And then secondly, the other one, which actually I think is probably less on people's minds, but it was on mine straight away, was what organizational changes does this make us embrace? What does it enable tiny organizations to do that used to require a massive one? Um, and so if you wouldn't mind, perhaps if you could start with the sort of, here are a few challenges, historical, researchers or, or researchers more generally might face here's how you would address them and then we can talk more generally thank you absolutely and it relates back to part of our previous discussion where we were talking about these large data sets um, of information which previously basically was inaccessible that data was no longer it had been written down somewhere it had been stored in an archive whether that's within parliament a library in Congress, whether that's in the home office, whether it's just on your computer in a Word document, which you never see again. Suddenly we're at this point where we can use tools because of large language models. So uh, for those who are familiar, so tools like ChatGPT and similar kind of models to really take those pieces of data they do need to be digitized first, though, of course. So there is still that human effort to do so. But once they are digitized, luckily, that is always there. And there is an issue where somebody deletes it, but we'll ignore that. Basically, suddenly, you are able to extract insights about this huge pile of data, which previously may not have been possible. And this could be data along the lines of, uh, and this relates to projects we've done in the past, um, statistics data. So say, for example, how much did uh, milk cost in 1960? And then suddenly, without having to go through tons of pages, which might take you hours, you can ask using natural language, and you can get the answer within a few seconds, which is incredible. But 
more importantly as well is that you can then use tools which are being developed at the moment um, to automatically analyze that data in a simple way so that you could find out, okay, what is the price of milk over time from all of this data? And also considering some of the other documents that have been put in, what might be the causes of this? And then suddenly you've got a lot of condensed information about the specific question you've got with a fraction of the time. And during my work at uh, my previous company, I've really found that, I mean, this can be multiple factors of increase. Uh, I think with one project, it was 23x, which is incredible. Um, so it's really opening up an incredible opportunity for researchers in many different fields to understand this data. Um, I would say that one challenge, um, and it still is a challenge for these models, is that data formats does change over time. That is something that we found, particularly in Back to the Future, I had to deal with all of these kinds of things like decimalization happening between 1960 and 1984. Um, suddenly, you do have to try and make sure that the model is taking this into account. But also the fact that data is more heavily weighted towards the present because we create absurd amounts of data um, these days, which was not the case in the past. So these models are trained are primarily on data from today and more recently. And you've got a tiny, tiny fraction from different historical periods in the past. So that is a challenge. Um, it is also a challenge that if you put too much data in, it has more of a chance of hallucination, but uh, techniques are being used to make that better. Um, but overall, without going down too much of a, a rabbit hole, it opens up this opportunity to extract information in a condensed way, which previously may never have been possible. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, I just it's also it's not just a quantitative thing. I mean, but you and I, not everyone knows this. You and I did all these calculations on the any energy. How is energy output measured? In, in yeah. sort of, and we tra it transpired in the 1970s, the way of measuring almost anything in UK government terms changed. So we had to retrospectively find comparability between the, these two data sets. There was a rupture in the, the, the early 70s, like the decimalization of the pound. Um, a lot of people, if you didn't know your history, you'd be calculating apples and oranges, comparing them with each other before and after that particular date. Now, I was just going to say, it was really interesting. I, on the qualitative sense and the time saving, resource saving, we'll get onto it in a minute. I was reading a book by Robert Caro, the famous biographer who writes books over a thousand pages long. And he, you know, in the writing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, he would travel for years to people's hometowns of famous politicians to sort of soak up the atmosphere and, and speak to the locals, which is brilliant if you've got literally years to do it. Full time he was doing this. Whereas now in a small way, it's not the same, sure, but you can go to Google Map and look almost anywhere in the free world at what do the shops look like and are there trees and you can get a bit it's get a bit of the atmosphere no not 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 competing with a two part two uh, pulitzer prize winner in that particular case um mark to, the thing about organizational innovation and scale uh time saving and resource saving like what what's the biggest cool thing you could tell us about you know what we can do i guess sure. well i would say that because of the kind of orders of magnitude change that I discussed earlier, not only in terms of information extraction and understanding, but also in terms of the capability of individuals to do certain tasks. So coding was mentioned earlier. Um, that is significantly easier now. I use GitHub Copilot, for example, and my life is significantly easier. It's like a very good autocomplete. I'm still needed, but less so. Um, what I would say is we're looking at a situation where companies can be created which have a significant impact, significant turnover with far fewer people. And potentially we're kind of in the region where we may get a single person company creating something like a unicorn. That is now a possibility which probably would never have been in the past. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see whether that transpires, but certainly that kind of region is becoming far more possible, um, particularly as we look at more and more tasks being automated and controlled effectively via natural language by a human. So um, yeah, very exciting. And it'll be really interesting to see what 
what happens in that in that area. Thank you, Mark. Um, that's bit we've been talking for a while now. I'd love some of the people on this call are very skilled at these areas. I know they're interested in seeing both of these sides of the equation. Um, anyone got any points or contributions they want to make at this stage? We, we do have one. Someone's typing in as we speak. Um, I'm just going to read it out to everyone. Um, how do you think the development of AI will parallel or differ from significant technological advancements in history? And what could be the potential societal impacts um, besides the MISO level bracket, brackets company? I, th you, I mean, this is the kind of question people ask me all the time, but it's your, it's your seminar today, Mark. So why don't we see what you've got to say to this? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So thank you for that. A very large question to answer, so I'll do my best. But um, my thought would be initially that the difference that first comes to mind is that it's actually a lot of the white collar, high skilled jobs which are being targeted rather than the blue collar, low skilled jobs, which because robotics has not caught up to the same level as foundation models slash large language models, actually, um, are far less uh, likely to be automated. So um, the chances of somebody picking apples is far less likely to be automated than somebody who's copywriting marketing, for example, or data entry, which is unusual because it, it's usually the other way around. If we think of, for example, the threshing machine, uh, we think of all kinds of technological changes in the past, it's usually started from the lower end of the socioeconomic hierarchy. Um, so that's what I would say is the main difference. Um, I would say that in terms of parallels, I do think that, look, it, it is another technological change at the end of the day. Um, it is pretty revolutionary, but at the same time, there have been similar kind of quiet changes in the background. So if we take coding as an example, um, although we now have this ability to... Um, have autocomplete for like different functions or pieces of code um, in like when when writing and writing out code. Um, in we have gone from writing an assembly code where we're literally moving around to the bits um, to la higher level languages like Python, where a lot of that is abstracted away. So you are still able to do a lot more, but it's not, uh, for example, um, uh, an AI development there. So in one way, it's an extension. But um, I would also state that, uh, like other changes, it enables people to do a significant amount more uh, than previously would be possible for a single individual. And uh, as mentioned, potentially allowing someone could do to do tasks which an entire team would have done, uh, particularly when it comes to data extraction. So I don't know how much you want me to, to go into this, Michael, because I could go on forever. So I'll let you stop me on this one. Thank you. Forever is a bit a bit long, perhaps, but great stuff there. Thanks. Well, I, th I think your point about white collar anxieties is, is, it speaks to the moment in late 2022 when people sat down and tried chat GPT the first time, which then has defined the debate as what product we're talking about, what you know, what are the, the fears? It's about text, right? I think people, if you know what you're doing, there's also video imagery, processing, all this kind of stuff. Um, Mark, unless there's any more questions, and please do type them in the chat, anyone who's got them. I would like to ask something, that, uh, in addition to things you and I talk about, like, Mark, how can you process my 1,000 handwritten documents that I don't want to have to read um, and print out manually and so on? Um, the, my question would be in the related questions of storage kind of backups and also cybersecurity, because, you know, on the one hand, you get, okay, well, these guys are talking, the audience might say, and well, I need to keep a backup in here and here and here. No, a physical, a physical digital backup, a, phys a, a, di a cloud digital backup, a paper backup, two paper backups for something that's really important. That's a ton of stuff. And yes, it will mean probably you'll never lose your things ever again in one way or the other. But also it means you then have four copies of things that people can read. Um, like what, I, I don't know the answer to this, what what would you recommend is the kind of optimal backup system we need to be able to grapple with this kind of thing? Sure. So I would say that probably, and this fits in with a lot of my background in cloud architecture, but in terms of storage now uh, in the cloud is basically free because it's so, so cheap. Um, so my recommendation would be to 
back it up in the cloud in, and you can make sure that it's backed up in several regions. So if a data center goes down because there's a hurricane in a certain area, then it will be backed up in another region. So I would recommend that that is a good approach because it does mean that look, it is so cheap that it's basically free. I, I would recommend that. Um, of course, you know, it depends a little bit on the security of that particular data. Um, again, cloud is pretty good at that these days. Um, it, it is very good and probably, probably the most secure way in which you can store something um, because someone can always get into your house and find any pieces of paper, whereas cloud is protected by some of the best security engineers in the world. Of course, again, it does vary case by case. So that's what I would recommend personally. Thank you, Mark. Um, so unfortunately, paper manufacturers still, you know, not going to benefit from this. Um, I, I personally would recommend people, if something's really essential, print it out as well. Anyway, um, right, Jacob Forward, who's from Cambridge University, says, let's talk specifics. Are you using retrieval augmented generation pipelines or fine tuning on historical documents or relying on long context windows or all of the above and which works best in your experience? Great question. Great question, Jacob, and very topical. This comes up a lot. Um, so uh, for background, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with RAG or retrieval augmented generation, but this is essentially where you feed documents, say, for example, internal documents you may have within a company to a large language model so that it can answer questions. So it basically can go and look up some information in your database without having to actually retrain the model because fine tuning is effectively like a small amount of retraining. So typically what I've seen is that fine tuning tends to be very expensive. So most people, particularly when it comes to information extraction, will opt for uh, something like RAG and it tends to work pretty well. And also the other thing is that people will often opt for RAG with some of the smaller models as well and see how well they perform because some of the smaller large language models, of course, cost less per inference. Um, when it comes to long context windows, um, so this is uh, for uh, information for people on the call, this is the size of the information which is fed into the large language model inference or foundation model inference. Um, so what I have found is generally that it is better to have smaller contexts because longer contexts um, even with well put together RAG pipelines does tend to lead to more hallucination. It tends to lead to poorer results. Um, particularly if you say, for example, enter in um, several hundreds of PDFs of um, uh, invoices, for example, in different formats, it will tend to make mistakes. So my recommendation is generally smaller contexts um, using RAG um, and fine tuning only really if it's necessary. Um, and really where it's necessary is when it comes to very specialized data, say for example, medical data. Um, that's been a case where that has been preferential. Um, Thanks. Do Mark. feel free to follow up on that. Uh, don't want to go on. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, I think you, you both should talk about this some more. Um, we've got a few minutes left, everyone. This has been, time has, has whizzed by because it's so interesting. Anyone got any final points to make? Or am I going to ask about lip reading historical videos, which is my current historical challenge? Okay, so uh, Mark, I'm going to set you this challenge. So as, as we I mentioned this before, I've got five hours of historical video that has no audio that has not survived, right? I could sit down trying to, to work lip read a video or pay a video a lip reader. And this, this is an issue of employment, right? I mean, I don't want to I don't have the resources necessary to pay for everything to outsource. It, yep. is, is even this kind of, is there a tool for this, for instance? Is there an app for that? Uh, yes. I mean, it, the answer is that at this point, pretty much, um, so I, I'm subscribed to newsletters about um, AI tools. And honestly, it's, it, it's, it's mind blowing, the different tools that come out every single day and very hard to keep up. But the answer is we're getting to a point where this kind of multimodal data, so it's data with different modalities such as video, and that may have no audio, it may have audio, um, also might 
contain things like sensor data in other particular um, industries, which are then combined together to get a result such as, okay, feeding in these videos with no audio, what are they saying? What is the implication of that considering these particular articles I'm looking at or this additional relevant context that I have got? Um, so it is getting significantly more possible. There are tools for it. Um, I don't know the exact effectiveness of those particular tools, um, but um, there is there is very much hope that you won't have to pay a lip reader to uh, go through all of this. I feel bad for professional lip readers as a valuable skill, but um, we've got a final question here from, from a previous uh, speaker, actually, from one of these sessions. Duncan Money, um, do you have any recommendations on newsletters about new AI tools? Always on the lookout for things to make my work life easier. Yep, no, absolutely. So I've got a great newsletter. It's called Ben's Bytes. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it's called Ben's Bytes. Probably Ben came up with it and uh, it's Bytes about AI. But um, I find that is really useful. It gives you an overview of the latest developments and gives you the high level overview of what's going on. So I'd recommend that it gives you an email every day because that's the rate of change we're looking at. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd highly recommend subscribing. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Duncan. And thanks to Ben for doing an email every single day. Um, we, we still have a couple of minutes. If anyone's got anything else, I'll give it a, a few seconds for everyone to compose some thoughts. OK, other than that, watch this space. Um, this is precisely the kind of thing, I mean, for everyone's interest, you know, with the Project Hindsight brand, as it were, one of the things I started with now nine years ago was let what, what you know a, sta a standard historical project would be here's i know what the end is and i know the, what the means is so i just kind of need to get the resources together and spend the time and, and put it through and i was thinking the exact opposite i don't know what the end is i don't necessarily know what the means is either but what can be done by thinking in this flexible way and making use of the best tools available and it transpires as mark and i've been talking about a lot uh, both now and, and elsewhere you can get a lot done on a budget of zero or almost zero, um, and it will be historically durable. This is a matter of concerns for those historically minded is, is this an ephemeral moment where no one will remember what I'm doing? And I actually think, because as Mark said, because of the storage, the security issues, I think you can go from end to end here and create, create something that's just as good in many respects. Um, and that is really striking to think about when you think, you know, what was, what was possible, you know, sort of 60 years ago, but even in in more recent years. Okay, everyone, on that note, I, I think of it as an optimistic moment, everyone. I mean, you know, there's, there's opportunity here, and this is one of the things we we created this uh, event series to, to to build a platform where people could uh, exchange over this. So I'll exchange, um, I'll send on Mark's contact details, if that's right, after this, because I bet several people on here are going to want to talk with him. Uh, by all means, get in touch. People have been recommending speakers now for these events because they've been very well received. Thank you for, for those. And look forward to seeing you for the next ones. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone.